you very much for the opportunity. I'm one of the speakers that has been selected by the planted uh, cost action. I think you had already yesterday, but we will continue that. I also like to thank everybody else who was presenting already because I think you really shared the excitement and you, you really gave a good idea of what we can do with genome editing. And I'm sure that if, if you would be asked if tomorrow you would not be allowed to do it anymore, I'm sure it would be a shock. Yeah? Um, yesterday we've heard that if you want to import the GMO in Thailand, that's not possible, and there's somebody here in the audience who will be able to trace it. Yeah? Just imagine that that would happen if indeed the genome editing would also become eligible to that kind of privilege of being uh, tested on the border. Yeah? Anyhow, the GMO, what's in the name? I think that's indeed what we will be trying to touch upon. But before that, maybe a few words about the people that actually made sure that I, I got some finances to get here. The cost action. Um, cost action is a very particular kind of project. Its idea is to bring a network together. And you see it actually for the cost action here. We will have four years um, where we are going to have meetings, conferences, and so on. So the idea is really to have it multidisciplinary and to involve as many people as possible. The specific cost action that, that I'm talking about is planted. We started this year yeah, and you see a number of the topics and one of the topics is obviously also to promote the link between research and innovation in a societal responsible manner, read to have a good regulatory environment. Yeah? So it's definitely one of the goals of planted to also address that element, not just the science. Um, I think by now we are something like uh, 290 people that have joined the cost action. It's one of the biggest cost actions ever. Uh, I'm not sure about the actual rules and who can join, but if you're interested, then please go to the Plant Ed um, website and, and there are some indications on how you can join. You don't need to be in Europe. I think by now we have 36 countries being represented in the cost action. So, so please look at it if you're interested. And by the way, we have our first training school in January, which will be about regulations. Yeah? So if you are interested after my talk, then um, you can still join us there. As I said, I'm part of it. I'm actually a co-chair of the Working Group 3, which is about regulations and policy. Uh, but as such, I'm not, representing, well, I'm not representing any position of Planted. I will just share with you some of the ideas that we have. Who are we, uh, as Wendy mentioned, uh, with Perseus? Um, we are a service company focused on biosafety and biotech regulations. So we help organizations to, to deal with some of the challenges that Michael was, was showing in terms of what is already out there and what is specific for biotech. So obviously that, uh, that fits completely with, with the topic here of genome editing and understanding how regulations may influence uh, our work and how we may influence regulations. You've heard about this, and actually I think it cannot be stressed enough that on one hand we are obviously excited about the science and the business that can come out of this because we see the unequal precision, we see the new possibilities, you see the speed and ease and, and the way that we accumulate this information is, is incredible. Yeah? But we're always reminded of societal issues, values, ethics. Um, and how do we deal with that? How do we strike that balance? I'm sure that all of you think that you're very moral persons, that actually there's nothing in your life that you would like to do that would even seem to be close to doing something wrong. But nevertheless, there may be people that actually look at this differently. Yeah? So the question, one of the questions that I would like to address for a short while is, is really to say, like, how do we get to this point? Why, did we, why are we suddenly challenged here? Yeah? Uh, we all come with good intentions, at least I hope so. Um, and, and I'm sure that if you look at your science, you're convinced that what you're doing is going to contribute not just to knowledge, but really to the better of mankind. So, so how do we get here? I'm going to give you a few ideas, but um, actually, if you want to know more, uh, read this book. I'm not sure if you know it, but if you want to read, I mean, this is, it gives a wonderful uh, summary of what happened since Mendel, uh, of course, you know many of these things, but it puts it in a perspective and it puts it in a societal perspective. And it's really interesting to read all the stories, stories about scientists who are actually involved in discovering the genes and discovering the genome and beyond. So I really encourage you to do it because it gives a very good view, something that I cannot capture in the few minutes that we have. 
Where did it start? Actually, a lot of people will go back to this one letter. One simple letter coming out of the early days, yeah, 1973. To me, it looks like yesterday, but many of you yeah, were probably not yet there. Anyhow, um, at this conference, people were debating because they, they saw the power of recombinant DNA. They saw the power and they could see that actually they could do a lot of interesting things with that. They finally discovered what the genes are made about yeah, and how they can work with that. But during those deliberations, they also felt like, obviously, we should think about the side effects. We should think about maybe negative effects. And in that letter, there is this interesting sentence. In this way, new kinds of viruses with biological activity of unpredictable nature may eventually be created. Very simple sentence. But it actually is a trigger, because that one really sets off the point about, let's think about this. Because maybe some of those biological activities of unpredictable nature may not be as benign as we think. And we should do something about that. This letter really started it off. And this is where recombinant DNA also got this kind of a, an idea of we should be careful. Now, we should be careful. What does that mean? Again, read the book for, for all of the details. But nevertheless, you see that in 1974, we go for a voluntary moratorium. Science would not be science if you would not come up with solutions. So already in 1975, at the famous Asilomar conference, people got together. And it's actually also interesting to read how that conference was, was made and trying to involve different stakeholders, also the public, to set safety guidelines, to say, like, although we understand now that there may still be some uncertainties, we also understand how we can work in a safe way if we adapt proper guidelines. And from that point on, you see that there's a, a cascade. We see uh, guidelines. We see in the US there's a coordinated framework. We see Europe coming up with legislation. And then later on, of course, you have more of the international developments like the Cartagena Protocol. And also in Africa, we see, like at, at a higher level, some ideas about working with on safety and biotechnology. Nevertheless, from that one initial event, yeah, you could see, as also as Michael was saying, different territories or different policies taking different directions. And just to give you an idea, if you're looking at, well, first of all, obviously, this is also related because it leads to, this might lead into the creation of unexpected nature. It's not that we found that there is a, diff that there is a problem. Yeah? We are addressing this because of precaution. Again, precaution is relatively new for us because it's something which only, like in 1992, was one of the first times that people really put it on paper. It's a very difficult one uh, to, to understand how it's put in practice. Um, but still, this is the basis of, on one hand, addressing this, this uncertainty and still uh, working towards uh, an effective use of your technology. So how do people work on that? As I said, in the US, the US authorities said we have legislation and you know from a US point of view we're not into making new legislation if we don't need that so let's see what we have and let's see if we can cover the potential risks of biotechnology through our existing legislation that led to a coordinated framework in which indeed there is a focus on the product yeah rather than the process they focus on verifiable scientific risks and they will use the existing legislation and the existing uh, authorities to uh, deal with that. And you see a number of the authorities here mentioned, depending on the product that you have and depending on the type of application that you're looking for. Interesting enough, this also means that actually uh, GMOs as such don't exist in the US. In the US law, there is no concept of a GMO. They've been using the existing legislation and if you go to the, uh, for instance, to the NIH guidance, then they're still talking about recombinant DNA. Of course, people colloquially use the word GMO, but nevertheless, there is not a clear definition of what is considered a GMO. If today you have, we are working with, a, for instance, a genome edited uh, material, then here is a, a way to deal with that. You can go to the USDA if you're working with plants, you can go to the USDA you can follow this, this wonderful process, am I regulated under, yeah? which means you send a letter and a few months later you get a reply whether in fact your product is considered to be regulated or not. 
They're not saying it's GMO, they're saying it's regulated or not. And if it's regulated, you need to get an approval. Very simple process, very clear, fits within the existing legislation. By the way, you can also look, yeah, if you go to the same website, you can look at all those people that have already submitted letters and what the outcome of those submissions were. Yeah? So, very transparent, very clear system. Canada has followed another road. Canada has looked at novelty. Yeah? They say we're actually not as much interested in the process of the products, we're interested in the new trade, in the novelty that is there. And if it's really something novel, then we're looking at it. It doesn't really matter how you make it, yeah? whether you do it through, through traditional mutagenesis or through breeding or whatever. If it's something that we've not seen before, we're going to look at that. So Canada has again followed a very different approach from the US, but focusing on the novelty and thereby focusing on the potential impact. The EU was one of the first to really say, no, uh, we, we really want to have something specific. We're really going to look at a legislation and we're going to do that at the EU level. Why at the EU level? Because indeed, uh, European countries, we're close to each other, these organisms may reproduce, they may cross national borders, and therefore we should uh, harmonize this at European level. It should be obviously preventive, and we're going to make a specific class. We're going to call these things genetically modified organisms. And actually, if you go back to the early days of this legislation, during the preparation, people were still talking about recombinant DNA, and when it finally comes to the first directives, suddenly the word genetically modified organisms are defined. Which also means that this is one of the first definitions that you'll find about what is a GMO. It's a definition in the law, which doesn't necessarily mean that it's uh, very scientific. What does it say? It says, of course, where the genetic material has been altered in a way that does not occur naturally by mating and or natural recombination. Read the directives to have all the finesses of the, of the law, yeah? but just in a nutshell, we have the world of the living organisms. We have those organisms which obviously are non-GM, yeah? where the mating happens or where you have natural recombination. We forget about those. We now have the genetically modified ones. And in the genetic modified ones, we have those which are in scope of the legislation. But we also have a category which is excluded from the legislation. So we have GMOs, we all understand they're GMOs, but they're excluded from the legislation. Why was that category present there? Well, people saw that, for instance, if you use mutagenesis, then obviously you have a genetically modified organism. Of course, it's a mutant. But we have been doing that for such a long time, we're not going to call everything that we've used so far GMOs. We're going to exempt them, we're going to exclude them from the legislation. And this is what happened. If you look at the definition, it is a complex definition, where in fact there's two techniques which are excluded from the application, mutagenesis and cell fusion, in as much as it concerns species that can also cross through traditional breeding. This was fine in the 90s. Yeah, this definition goes back to the 90s, and this is what people came up as a uh, compromise. But then gradually we have the new techniques coming on, and in 2007 yeah, there was a list of new breeding techniques which was put forward to the commission to say, like, we have these new techniques, and we are not quite sure in which of these boxes they fit. Can you help us? 2007. I'm not going to go through all the loopholes that uh, actually have been happening since. But you all know that actually the, the first time that we got a real answer was 2018. 2018, we have the European Court of Justice that indeed decides that organisms developed with modern mutagenesis techniques still fall within the scope, are not excluded from the application of the law. So to make that clear, beforehand we said that mutagenesis obviously lead to a GMO, even the traditional mutagenesis leads to a GMO, but those are excluded from the application of the law. The court says, because actually that is based on the fact that you had experience, all of the new techniques with which you had no experience, 
you could not have excluded them when you had the legislation being put in place. And that's the only logic that is there. And again, I don't object to that logic because on paper that sounds like a, a very logic thing to do. You cannot exclude something which you don't have yet. Yeah. However, of course, this is a, a shock to us because I think all of us understand that if you compare a irradiation mutagenesis or a chemically induced mutagenesis, it's less precise, it's far more bound to have side effects and so on than what we are doing. So from that point of view, there is no reason why you should exclude the old ones and not the new ones. But that's the, the logic that was there. So obviously after this, as soon as this came out, you have two reactions. On one hand, you have a number of NGOs that applaud because they say, look, all of these new techniques have, have side effects and they should be evaluated. They're all GMOs. And on the other hand, we see a reaction in the scientific community, industry community, to say like, this makes no sense. And actually, this is going to stop us from applying techniques which are really providing more precision and helping us in our research. And indeed, 2018, it's not that far. Uh, things have continued to happen. Yeah? There is a lot of uh, communication about this. You can hardly uh, wait the day before there's something else or there's a new meeting coming up where people are discussing this. So it's good that it's alive. Uh, I only hope that it remains alive because we're only at the, at the beginning of a, of a long way to get there. What have been some steps on this long way? Well, there's a few here. For instance, in Europe, we had the uh, uh, scientific advice mechanism, which is a group of scientific advisors, higher level, who already immediately said in, in October or November last year, they came out with a clear statement to say, this should change, this is not logic. GRC, we have a document from you yeah, where uh, you again address the issues of how can you detect yeah, and how can you make a distinction between a natural mutation and an induced mutation. Commission has sent EFSA uh, a mandate, and I think Nils has been discussing that yesterday, about how can we even do the risk assessment for uh, SDN1 and SDN2 um, applications. And recently... Um, I think 7th of November or, yeah, 7th of November, Council in Europe has asked the Commission uh, to start a study and to deliver some answers in, in 18 months from now where they should address the findings of the court case and should come up with proposals on how to change the law into a more reasonable way. So these things are ongoing, but keep in mind that obviously the, the other discussion which is happening in public is also very fierce. Uh, only this week there was another uh, group of reactions uh, from NGOs to say like we really don't want to see new legislation, we want the Commission immediately to enforce the existing legislation that is there and to make sure that these products are regulated and are controlled as GMOs. Yeah. So if, if today somebody tells you, you see it is GMO in Europe and uh, it will be regulated as GMO, for the time being, that is true, but keep in mind that Europe is, is still making up its mind about this. So if you would, in your countries, yeah, where you may not have the luxury of such long uh, legal debates, yeah, then actually keep in mind that there is also an evolution ongoing and that there may be changes in the, the European legislation. Good. Clearly, if you want to look for legislation that encourages innovation, then you don't want to wait for 11 years to get an answer that is still not workable for you. I would prefer a system where I can send a letter to an authority and get an answer in a few months. If I'm into innovation, I'm not going to do it here because I'm not even sure what the outcome of this will be. In fact, I'm sure that today I will be regulated as a GMO yeah. with all the consequences of that. And I think you mentioned uh, the one million dollar question this is more than a $1 million question because the difference between placing a GMO on the market or a non-GMO on the market is several tens of millions of euros, plus the fact that, as you know, in Europe we hardly have products of GMOs, so even then, if you have done the investment and you got the approval, then uh, you're still not sure that uh, you have the, uh, the way to get to the market. What I would like to look with you, just a few last slides on, on looking forward, is that obviously we've seen how we moved from recombinant DNA to the GMO definition in Europe. 
but I put the LMO definition as a little shadow. The LMO definition is the one that we get in the Cartagena protocol, which came much later than the, than the European directives. And it's slightly different again. So well, if you're thinking about what is a GMO, then you can have a long list of these uh, definitions. Keep also in mind that I've only discussed with you three ways. I've discussed the US, Canada, and Europe. But obviously, there are also other uh, ways of looking at GMOs. Uh, for instance, Japan and Canada was uh, and Australia was already mentioned. But I would like to draw your attention to another development that we see coming on, and uh, which is the synthetic biology. Yeah. And again, when I first heard synthetic biology, I had a, an idea about what it would be, and I could not immediately see an issue. But I invite you to read this definition. This is the operational definition which is debated within the uh, framework of the Convention of Biological Diversity. It's a further development in new dimension of modern biotechnology that combines science, technology, and engineering to facilitate and accelerate the understanding, design, redesign, manufacture, and or modification of genetic materials, living organisms, or biological systems. I invite you to argue with me that your work is not fitting into that definition. It's going to be very tough. We haven't learned from defining things. This definition is so broad that anything we do in today's biotechnology fits into that. Oh yes, and by the way, there's a small point. These products of synthetic biology can be regulated as GMOs because probably we can do exactly the same thing. If we get there, then again, we're going to close down on a lot of our research. You were asking, what can we do? If you don't agree with this decision, with this kind of definition, then get active now. It's already late, because as you see, it's an operational definition that was put forward in 2016. But talk to your authorities, make sure that there's a little bit more science in these discussions than only legal stuff. Finally, you can also you could also ask experts, or you can go back to history. And this is the one that obviously inspired me for the title of my talk. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. He already knew that it was nothing to do about the process. He knew it has to do with the characteristics of the product. Thank you very much.